Good morning, everyone. My name is Don Mears. I'm a member of UCD. And I'll be reading a um, poem by Walt Whitman called Miracles. And this is part of the uh, series, the magnum opus of uh, Walt Whitman. What shall I give? And which are my miracles? Realism is mine, my miracles. Take freely, take without end. I offer them to you after ever your feet can carry you or your eyes can reach. Why, who makes much of a miracle? As to me, I know of nothing else but miracles. Whether I walk the streets of Manhattan or dart my sight over the roofs of houses toward the sky, or wade with naked feet along the beach, just in the edge of the water, or stand under trees in the woods, or talk by day with anyone I love, or sleep in the bed at night with anyone I love, or sit at the table at dinner with my mother, or look at strangers opposite me riding in the car, or watch honeybees busy around the hive, of a summer forenoon, or animals feeding in the fields, or birds, or the wonderfulness of insects in the air, or the wonderfulness of the sundown, or of stars shining so quiet and bright, or the exquisite, delicate, thin curve of the new moon in spring. These, with the rest, one and all, are to me miracles, the whole referring yet each distinct and in its place. To me, every hour of the light and dark is a miracle. Every single cubic inch of space is a miracle. Every square yard of the surface of the earth is spread with the same. Every foot of the interior swarms with the same. To me, the sea is a continual miracle. The fishes that swim, the rocks, the motion of the waves, the ships with men in them. What stranger miracles are there?
Good morning. My name is Lindsay, and I am honored to welcome you to worship this morning. Whether this is your first time with us or attending our Sunday services is part of your regular routine, we are glad that you're here and hope you will find room in this community for your spirit. We continue to be grateful for the technology that allows us to worship together online and continue to build community in other ways. Thank you in advance for your patience and grace with any delays or glitches we may experience. Our thanks to Judy and Wayne, our Zoom tech and video sharer today, and our readers, Don Mears, Susan Boyce, Molly Keough, Sarah Russell, Gloria Gross, Dave Rowell, and Alex LeClaire. In addition to our worship each Sunday at 10, we meet on Tuesday nights at seven for a more informal time of check-in and sharing. Please consider joining us for that gathering. Uh, by way of announcements today, there will be a social and environmental justice committee meeting today at noon. You will find the link to that meeting in yesterday's e-blast. Now, I invite you to take a deep breath as we reaffirm our intentions to be a radically welcoming community. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, Whatever your religious beliefs are or aren't, you are welcome in this spiritual community. However you move in this world, how much or how little is in your bank account or wallet, however you are feeling in this moment, you and all of who you are, are welcome in this spiritual community. We are all enhanced by being together. The words this morning for our chalice lighting are from J.E. Abernathy. Love is our greatest purpose. We affirm that love is our greatest purpose. Accepting one another is the truest form of faithful living. The search for truth is our constant star. We pledge our hearts, minds, and hands to challenge injustice with courage to find hope in times of fear, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as a beloved community. Thus we do covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life. Please join me in our uni unison affirmation. Words are in the chat box. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great, greatest, our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Said it's hard to really see it and the reason why we live in Don't chase it with your eyes can recognize it till it's given The world in front of me became the molding of my vision The pain that came to me is what I blame in my decisions How can I find the courage when my heart is feeling missing? How do I find a time when I know that the clock is ticking? I'm a soldier for this love is guaranteed to be my mission Wish I could find it easy like I see it in the children Hey, Looking back as I move forward, Sankofa I want a love that explodes, call it a supernova What it takes to reach the heavens, let me stand closer Put the pieces all together the witness Jehovah God is patient with a sunny plant to see to let it grow when I love it unconditional I learn to let it go open your arms what I'm talking about without a doubt I can feel the love reaching out my love reaches out can you feel it yeah. 
I'm never giving up, I'm keeping cool, I'm in control My praise, I give it up, a higher power's in control This light is guiding me, I'm armed with everything I know This love is getting closer, I can feel it in my soul Long as I am living, I still got the time to show The patience that was given from the ones that let me grow Forgive me for debating back and forth, to and fro This love is reaching out, I'm giving it to you and yours Walk with me in solidarity My sanctuary eases my disparity When I look into your eyes, I'm looking carefully What do you know? There is me No more questioning the things that I can never see Touch, taste, smell, hear, no more mystery Just the faith that's stronger than my pain and misery I found it in myself and it will forever be The breath of love that gave me the breath of life I breath of life, spirits, give it back and I energize If I never take another, let my voice come and speak it out And give you the feeling of love reaching out My name is Mala Keo, and each week at UUCD, we include a brief UU moment in our worship service that serves to make us aware of and to nurture our connection to the larger body of Unitarian Universalists and the Unitarian Universalist Association that binds us together. This week, we want to hearken back to 2013 when Doug Mutter wrote in the UU World, an article on political empathy. Though written almost a decade ago, it sounds particularly present today. Doug wrote, lately I have begun to fantasize about a different kind of discourse. What if rather than learning to demonize people who hold different views, we learned how to picture them positively and empathize with them, even if we continued to believe they were wrong. If you think of politics as war, this may seem and sound like unilateral disarmament, but I wonder how many people do the current tactics actually persuade anyway? When ordinary folks have been angered or humiliated, do they change their minds? Or do they go back to their partisan mentors to learn the counter arguments they should have used? My own views don't change much month to month. 
but they have evolved considerably over the last few decades. Mutter goes on to say, I grew up in the white working class surrounded by people much like myself. My parents in their Lutheran church taught me the virtues of justice and compassion. But I also absorbed the assumptions of the unjust society around me. I didn't hate people less fortunate than myself or revel in my superiority. But I saw others through that blurry lens of traditional stereotypes, which told me that the problems of women, blacks, gays, and other dissatisfied groups resulted from a combination of their own shortcomings and the immediate laws of nature. I came to reject those views, not because I lost arguments, but because I gained experience and grew in empathy. I remember, for example, the exact moment when I became committed to marriage equality. My wife and I went out to dinner with a close friend and a lesbian couple who didn't know, we didn't know well. Same-sex marriage is not even in a, in a proposal yet in that state. So it didn't come up in our conversation. But the two women were so obviously good for each other and their relationship so similar to ours that I was never again able to believe they were doing something fundamentally different than we were. I doubt I'd have changed any of my former views if anyone I met agreed with me or if society had consented to stay the same until I was ready to move. But I didn't change because someone beat down my defenses. The world was already changing without me and somebody made a space for me to get on board. Good morning, I'm Sarah Russell. And it is now that time in our service where we can share our joys and concerns. We offer one another now the opportunity to share very briefly what is most on our hearts, life celebrations, and our personal concerns. As you do so, we invite you to light a candle in your own space. Through the action of sharing and kindling a flame, we give energy to our best thoughts, meditations, sympathies, celebrations, and prayers. We hold these as sacred in our collective hearts. Indeed, as our opening song stated, we are gathered in the spirit, though our bodies are apart, and we tend to one another with our gifts and with our care and our community is strengthened through the faith and hope we share. We also would like to invite anyone new to our community at this time, you can introduce yourselves if you would like. We welcome you warmly and would be pleased to light a candle in honor of your connection with us and whatever joys and concerns you carry in your heart. So at this time, Please change your view to gallery view in the upper right corner of your screen so that you can see everyone who is here. As you feel led, please unmute your microphone and share with us, our family, this joy or concern that you have and light your candle if you have one. Please watch the mute signals on the lower left of each person's picture to see if anyone else is muted. It is best that we share one at a time. And remember to please mute after you have shared. We light one final candle for the joys and concerns that were not spoken by those of us here in solidarity with others in our community who could not be with us today.
As Unitarian Universalists, the central part of our worship in person and online is the opportunity we all have to practice the art of generosity and the spiritual practice of gratitude. Our gifts to our congregation are what allow our communities to live into our calling and mission. We are grateful to you for the many ways you support our community, including your financial pledges and offerings. Your gifts matter, and it's one of the ways that you can make this world a better place. Thank you for your passion and generosity. For those who are making pledges or who want to contribute to UUCD, please visit www.uucd.org and click on Support UUCD for more information on how to donate online. Our offertary video today is not so much a song as it is a brief snippet of what an inspirational speech delivered by Martin Luther King in Montgomery, Alabama in 1965. This is the part of the speech where he famously references the arc of the moral universe. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, How long? Yes, because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long, How not long? long. How long? Do forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, sir. How long? Not, Not long. long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is tipping out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. This truth is marching on. In our gathering this morning, the words are David Rico's. We go on loving. What makes us human beings so uniquely wonderful in the puzzling universe that is we never give up love, on love, for love, with love, all the words. Against all odds, with no guarantee of being loved in return. Out of the hate and hurt so often handed us, in the face of the sad suffering history has let us see, we go on loving. What deep respect we deserve for this capacity of ours to make love out of anything and to let it last. Our reading this morning is a single thoughtful phrase and it comes from Judith Hanson Lassiter. There is no question for which compassion is not the answer. Good morning, Michael Bolero here. 
my reflection this morning, our reflection this morning is going to be on compassion and empathy. I first started thinking about this. Um, when I was teaching at the university, helping to prepare young social work students for a career as a healthy professional. I would often speak of the importance of empathy in our work. There was always a consensus that empathy was critical to good social work practice. But the discussion ended there. Were we to assume that all social workers shared this characteristic? If we did not have empathy, where was it taught? I searched and became aware that nowhere in the social work curriculum was anyone offering a course on empathy or compassion. If everyone in my profession does indeed share a degree of empathy and compassion, then the question is moot, except of course for the questions of how much empathy and compassion are required. Is it enough? How shall we measure it in the first place? I was reminded of these concerns in conversation with a fellow professional with respect to the question of poverty. This conversation came up in the context of what we call professional development, as when one therapist reveals to his or her cohort that a number of impoverished clients in this case were appearing in my client panel. And it's frustrating to work with clients whose needs are so great and resources so scarce to help them through difficult circumstances. So we share with other professionals in the hopes that maybe we can gain some new resources. During one such discussion, I was told that poverty was not a systemic problem, but a personal one. And we could always help such clients by teaching them how to better manage or budget their money. But what if it were not a question of good money management? What if instead, if it was a question of simply not having enough money? I was told that it's not a matter of how many resources you possess, but how you allocate them. Perhaps you've heard this ideology before. Such folks tell us that problems of impoverishment are simply a matter of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. Bootstraps, if you remember, are those leather loops located toward the back and top of each boot. Should you sit down and hold your legs in the air, you should be able to pull on your boots by tugging on the strap. However, if both boots are on your feet and your feet are planted firmly on the ground, bending down to pull yourself up by them is impossible. There is no way you can simply lift yourself up magically in the air. Asking someone to do the impossible illustrates to me a distinct lack of empathy and compassion. Furthermore, insisting that the solution to impoverishment is always a personal one can do some damage. It distinctly blames poverty upon the victim of impoverishment, like blaming the victim for the crime. At the same time, this ideology assumes that the larger society bears no responsibility as it denies there's any systemic impediments to economic equality. I'm reminded of that phrase I heard somewhere, the poor you will always have with you. Well, I am always that guy who wants to shut out why, as in, why is this so often assumed true? Those who steadfastly fail to see the systemic concerns that give rise to poverty are illustrating an unwillingness to be critical of the status quo. They exhibit a strong need to see the world as fair, no matter the evidence to the contrary. They apparently lack the ability to place themselves in another's boots, and as a consequence, appear to lack a modicum of empathy or compassion. Many of us may have witnessed in others or in ourselves a capacity to grow empathy and compassion as a result of coming to terms with new appreciations of injustice. Consider how, 
in my own white culture, there was once a propensity to accuse people of color of playing the race card when referencing disproportionality related to racial concerns. This is how Black Lives Matter protests were dismissed in those early years of the movement when white allies were more scarce than they are today. Some still vehemently object to characterizations of racial inequity as if racism were a personal problem instead of a systemic one. Meanwhile, the rest of the culture had joined in to make the Black Lives Matter movement the largest movement for social change in human history. Not only is it global in scope, but even predominantly white communities rose up in protest following the murder of George Floyd. Compare this response to say the beating of Rodney King in the 1990s. While the nation did erupt in protest following the acquittal of the police officers who perpetrated the vicious beating, the scale and duration of the protest did not match what the world witnessed following the death of George Floyd. After decades of trying to convince ourselves that things must change, somehow things did not change in any way but the most minor. Over the decades, what has changed is the one's dominant concept that racism was the fault of a few bad apples. What is emerging in contrast is the thought that perhaps racism persists because it is a system woven into the fabric of our being in ways that are not addressed by minor modifications in police training. The idea that systemic issues outweigh personal concerns is gaining prominence. And this indicates to me an enlarged social and cultural capacity for empathy and compassion. So with this in mind, how might we enlarge our ability to empathize? We do this by recognizing, first and foremost, that our tendency to blame individuals rather than systems is something taught to us by an ideology that is uncompassionate and incapable of fundamental change. As long as we continue to blame individuals for our social problems, we absolve ourselves of any collective responsibility for true social justice. So where do empathy skills emanate in the first place if they are at risk of being quashed by an oppressive cultural ideology? Well, neuroscientists have proposed a theory of mirror neurons, which are somehow turned on in certain circumstances to allow one individual to experience similar emotions as another, walk in another's boots, so to speak. Examples of such mirror neurons in use are ubiquitous, not least in the act of lovemaking, which modesty prevents me from exploring in the course of this reflection, but you likely all know what I'm referring to here. A more well-worn example occurs when a new baby is born. And I wish to explore this further because I believe it may be very instructive to our query. I dare to speak about giving birth, even though my direct experience in this area is rather limited. So please bear with me. Upon going through labor, which I am assured is often an arduous task for mom, her body is likely to produce a large quantity of the stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol does not feel good. It's stress. It's what we produce uh, through the course of any day, but especially in copious amounts when we're highly stressed, such as when giving birth. Frequently, right after giving birth, as I am informed by watching every episode of Call the Midwife, the newborn is cleaned, swaddled, and placed in mom's arms. Ask any mom what it feels like when they are 
holding their baby for the very first time. Most often they will tell you this feels wonderful. I'm tempted to call that a miracle. After coming through a period of such great stress, now they're feeling wonderful. Neuroscience explains they feel wonderful because mom's brain is now being flooded with endorphins and dopamine. These are the feel good chemicals that counteract the effect of cortisol. Cortisol exists in inverse proportion to the amount of endorphins and dopamine we are able to produce at any given time. It is entirely appropriate that mom should have this resource available to her immediately following the act of birth. That this opportunity to restore her neurochemical balance is provided at this crucial time appears amazing to me. I'm even tempted to call it a miracle, an everyday miracle, perhaps. Mind you, personally, I've never done this, but nonetheless, it appears simply amazing. But as amazing as this may be, there's something even more amazing happening in mother's arms, for we know this is the moment that mirror neurons are first turned on in the young human. We don't exactly know how this happens, but we can measure the increase in endorphins and dopamine in the newborn, which appears to mirror the same phenomenon happening in the mother's brain. What this means is that one of the first things a newborn may come to recognize even before they learn the ability to speak, is that it feels comforting to be nurtured in the arms of a loved one. We may not understand how mirror neurons are triggered, but their existence is one of the first things we learn after we are birthed. An everyday miracle. Again, we have no explanation for how electrical and chemical reactions in one body can be mirrored in another separate body, especially a tiny body like that of a newborn who has very little experience of the world out of utero. Scientists have labeled this phenomenon mirror neurons, but we don't understand how they are evoked. We can observe evidence for mirror neurons and postulate that they are related to compassion and empathy, but we have no physiological explanation for the phenomenon. If mirror neurons are the key to empathy and compassion, if, I suspect it is significant that it's one of the first things we learn upon coming into this planet. I have little experience with other planets. It may be the single most important thing to learn from the perspective of our species survival if human beings are going to depend upon their parents for nurture, it would be essential that the mother and child bond as soon as possible. Within the family unit, the newborn quickly learns how his or her existence is very tied to the well being of their parents. Hence, how children are so quick to pick up on any disturbance that may inhabit their parents, even as the parents seek to hide these. Empathy and compassion are crucial components here. So later in life, who would deny the role of empathy and compassion in human development? What, what kind of people are capable of turning away from what we learned at birth? I'm postulating that likely someone who was terribly hurt as a child, someone who may have been unable to immediately bond with one or both parents. In psychological terms, we speak of such people as suffering from inadequate attachment. Among such people, we find it's often difficult to trust others. Loneliness and isolation come about, uh, pervasive feelings that they are alone in the world, capable of surviving by their own wits, unable to depend upon others. And this may arise among those who did not experience attunement when they were younger. Mind you, if you did experience this, this is not your fate. We can all learn to overcome this. People who are so hurt 
may feel um, that avoiding those feelings of connection, uh, those feelings of pain, because they don't have connection, they deny authentic connection. They deny it's even possible. And under these conditions, we are prone to imagine the world as ordered through a lens of justice that is entirely inconsistent with the lived experience of the more securely attached. They may tend to see all the problems in the world as personal, for they are too fragile to imagine the systemic context uh, for many of the world's issues. They may fail to see how human systems are founded on an interconnected web of human interactions, which require us to try and understand another's emotions, no matter how painful to us these emotions might appear. But hey, this is, this is all speculation. What is my takeaway here? Well, I have yet to discover how we might successfully teach compassion or empathy, though I long for someone to prove otherwise. But I also believe we don't have to teach empathy or compassion because in fact, this is something we are born with or start learning at the moment of birth. If we somehow lose this ability for any reason, it is only because it is somehow conditioned out of us. In other words, we may experience some reason to withhold empathy and compassion despite our inborn nature. We may not be able to teach empathy, but we can teach ourselves how to be indifferent to one another. I keep coming back to this notion that we may not have survived this long as a species if our ability to feel empathy were not in fact a dominant trait in human beings. I feel we would have killed ourselves off long ago if indifference instead were the dominant trait. This, this is the equivalent of believing in MLK's off-quoted observation that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I believe the arc bends toward justice because Empathy is drilled into us since the day of our birth. And barring any trauma to this bond, we have to all of, we have to all of humanity, empathy is more often the norm than not. It may be true that we don't entirely understand how empathy and compassion are turned on. And we have only a vague idea of what it means to nurture these feelings. But the most important thing we need to know is that they exist in the first place. This knowledge alone gives us hope. The mere fact that compassion and empathy exist at all is reason for hope. But there's also a second takeaway. I wish to help explain why, if we are all given to empathy and compassion, why are we so frequently seduced by reductionist arguments concerning the biggest social issues we face today? Allow me to give you a few examples. When faced with global climate change, someone might say, eh, if only individuals recycled more, then we wouldn't have this problem. When faced with sexual assault, some might say, if only she dressed more sensibly, this could have been avoided. When faced with poverty, we might say, if only those people could learn how to better budget their money. When faced with an opioid epidemic, we might say, if only addicts were capable of making better choices in their lives. And on and on, essentially blaming individuals for causing the social problem. When we consider this rationally, we might recognize this is pretty uncharitable. We might even say uncompassionate. We may know better, but it appears there's something within our very culture that encourages, encourages us to reduce all of our social problems into problems of the individual. In this age of rapacious capitalism, we glorify a few trillionaires who can afford an outer space adventure while ignoring the impoverished back on the planet's surface who must labor in overheated warehouses without benefit of a bathroom break. If you're unhappy with your job, it is said, go out and find a better job. In other words, it's your fault. It's not the larger system of capitalism. 
when viewed systemically, we might recognize that a warehouse job that pays $15 an hour is the better job as all the warehouse jobs that used to pay much more are disappearing, leaving people to scramble for what they can get. Meanwhile, and especially during the pandemic, the corporate elites are making money hand over fist, with the corporate bosses of Jeff Bezos increasing his wealth several fold, while many who participate elsewhere in the economy have, all, have only suffered during the shutdown. This is a systems issue, not an individual problem. It requires a systemic solution, not personal admonishment. If we care to look, issues of social justice may reveal some social roots, systemic conditions that may better explain poverty, addiction, rape, and even global climate change. This would require us to employ some empathy and compassion. Try this as an exercise in empathy and compassion. Try to become more aware of our tendency to address social problems by focusing only on the individual contributions. Then ask yourself, what might be the systemic underlying conditions that give rise to the social issue? In this manner, we may each help to correct the cultural impulse to blame the individual and start assuming more collective responsibility for what ails us socially. This would be the more compassionate perspective. This might be how we restore empathy. It is also not a bad place to start if we truly wish to solve many of the greatest social issues we face currently. Those were my thoughts. Hoping you found this reflection inspiring and or hopeful, blessed be. Our closing song this morning is Standing on the Side of Love as performed by the Unitarian Universalist Church of Berkeley. Uh, Michael, I just want to say I found your reflections um, quite inspirational. If you would all, please join me in extinguishing our chalice. The words are in the chat box. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our closing words today are from David Hicks McPherson, The Lifelong Goal. To wish for compassion, to pray for courage, to experience doubt, to bear sorrow, to strive for sureness. All these are qualities for which each of us should be grateful. But to feel a genuine fellowship for the whole human family, to act so that our empathy is evident wherever we go, that's the object. That's the lifelong goal. Our virtual worship has ended, but our connection to one another and the earth endures. Go blessed to be a blessing for others. <laughs>